And uh, I think last recorded episode, we were discussing uh, serpent symbolism and, uh, you know, mythology surrounding that symbol. And now we're moving forward into a new topic, uh, but also related, as all of this stuff usually is related in some way or another. Planetary change, catastrophes, natural disasters. Uh, right? Is that right, Randall? That's where we're going. I think we should delve into that for a while. Yeah. Crazy Decided. weather events. Yes. Yeah. And we need a context. I mean, especially with, uh, oh, you know, the political climate and the discussion, people need a better context to understand some of the claims being made back and forth. So I thought we could devote a few podcasts to looking into some of the things that might be considered kind of controversial. But, you know, we're always here hearing that we should follow the science. So, Okay, let's do that. Let's follow let's, the science. Yeah, See let's where it takes some science. Us. Mm-hmm. I'm all about it. May not lead to where some people want it to go, but we're going to give it a shot anyway. It might lead to us being kicked off YouTube. <laughs> well, <laughs> it might it might lead to us getting chastised a few yes. times. We have plenty of warning banners already. Yes, we do. Are we getting warning banners? Yeah, you yeah. get YouTube comments about that pretty regularly. Yep. Tell me about that. I don't know. They are, they are, they are badges of honor. That's how you look at it. Every time you get a warning banner from YouTube, you're like doing it right. Okay. We're getting warning banners from YouTube. (laughs) Are you saying, wait a minute, we have? So yeah. So what'll happen is we'll, you post a show and if YouTube, the algos are in the description or anything, they detect something that may be controversial. They'll put a little, a lot of times they'll put a link and say, here's the, you know, real story on whatever it is they think you're talking about. And they'll provide a link to something really? to the authorities. Yeah, to the authoritative statements of mainstream thought on that so, subject. Okay, so in in regards to the subjects we've been talking about, then what you're saying then is that the that the bona fide experts are weighing in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Through oh. the YouTube algos. Yeah. Exactly. Oh. Okay. Yeah. No, I haven't really looked. It's like you know the U the UN IPCC has determined that global you know, climate change is blah, blah, blah. And you should, you know, read here for that's before. right. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't gone back and look at them, but yeah, there's multiple videos that people, people comment that are flagged like that. Yep. But yeah, like Russ says, kind of a badge of honor. Yeah. Sure. It's like, but- okay, well, yeah, definitely listen to this because everything, Official. everything Official. is inst- instantaneously transcribed yeah. and it goes through a checking process as soon as you upload it. So that's what is it's, you know, it's transcribing everything. So it knows exactly what's said. So then it processes and says, oh, well, this is, uh, they said younger Dryas. Oh, that's a, that's a climate issue. Flag this one. Yeah. So you think that <laughs> younger Dryas is, n- is a trigger word or something? I, I think it, I think it's getting to be, if well, it's not already. Yeah. So, okay. That's cool. So what we want to, we want to see how many of those banners we can get. Yeah. That's what, that's Ideally. a good goal. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to more, <laughs> the more we get. Okay. Yeah, this one's got it already. So, yeah, we had some crazy weather out there on our trip, really the first time. Uh, we've been lucky out in the desert, uh, Four Corners, and in the Scablands. It's uh, been pretty sunny and nice, but we got uh, two days, three days of uh, really constant rain there in, in uh, Spokane, and then first two days in Idaho, and then uh, got hailed on in uh, <laughs> yeah. Missoula, uh, marble size <laughs> hail. So, yeah, it's kind of good to lead into a, a weather-oriented uh, episode here. I have a great video of, yeah. uh, I was in my van videoing Randall standing outside of his van <laughs> and it was just hailing on him. <laughs> I was just waiting and finally he's like, he's kind of like, okay, well maybe the hail's serious enough now and he starts heading towards the van and then I'm looking at his back and he's like, <laughs> so you got nailed. <laughs> Graham, same way. That was he was out there filming. Well, hailstorm. Yeah, we get, yeah, it's the most serious one I've been in in a few years anyway, yeah. for sure. But, yeah. um, well, what was great yeah, was that, everyone was blaming Randall. <laughs> of course. They were like, That's Randall, right. what's the deal? Like, can you stop the, the Zeus thing right now? <laughs> like, you call we made good money for this tour. We didn't yeah. sign yeah. up for all this rain and yeah. hail and <laughs> inclement weather. But, you know, I look, everybody got out in it. I got wet twice and dried off. Yeah. Um, no worse for the wear, but... You know, we stopped at um, at uh, Cabinet Gorge Dam, I think, was That's, our first real yeah. stop, wasn't it? Right. Yeah. That was impressive. Especially because 
so the oh, other thing yeah. that like a, along with all the rain we were getting rain having rain on us they had huge floods right before we came up there like right before the tour mm -hmm. started so everything all the rivers were up all the lakes were full like there was i mean they were literally having flooding there were huge logs floating down the river the rivers were going were rapid and wild waterfalls are gushing and the yeah. dams had the dams all the doors were open, open. Yeah, yeah big time yeah uh, that was uh it, yeah it, i mean how it was appropriate impressive. that we were out there uh you know to study the floods and then those first few days we got to see and it was amazing because the water was, I mean, it was loud. There was an incredible amount of mist and steam. And then the water mm -hmm. below the dam was, was turbulent. And there were all these crazy eddies and flows yep. and yep. waves splashing up against. There was a whole area around the side of the dam where you could see there was a big eddy that had cut, you know, when the flood was or way earlier when the flood was big, it cut it out of there. But we could watch the water. And then you're just thinking, like, take this times, like, I don't know, 5,000 5, or 10,000, you know, whatever. Several <laughs> orders of magnitude. <laughs> You know, you're watching this amazing thing and you're just like, this is tiny compared to yeah. what made this gorge. What we should say here is that this position, this is near the uh, mouth. So, uh, yeah, it's near the point where uh, just east of Lake Ponderé, near the uh, exit point of Lake Missoula, basically right where in the conventional model, the standard model, the lake water met the ice dam. And usually that position is centered pretty close around the current, the present position of Cabinet Gorge Dam. I had a very similar overall take on this portion of the, you know, the mega floods tours. Uh, all that driving, all those miles we covered, and you're just in this lake basin. Every time you go through a, a, a mm -hmm. narrows, and you come out and it's this massive valley that's, I mean, it's just the landscapes in that part of the world are just huge and vast and the mountains are tall and, you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of trees in a lot of the places and you can see the strand lines way out there. And it's just like, okay, this is insane how big this basin was and you're driving through the bottom of it and then you go through another narrows and then boom, it opens again many, 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 many miles down the road and you're mm -hmm. still doing it. And we, you just, it's like, this is so much. Okay. Sorry. It's like, yeah, we're under a thousand feet of water here. We're under 2000 feet of water. Yeah, right. Yeah. We're under 800 feet of water here. You know, just everywhere we went, basically we were at the bottom of a, a thousand foot plus deep lake. It's crazy. Yeah. So it's once again, it's far too vast. I think even to conceptualize while you're driving through it, it's in other words, mm -hmm. seeing it, for me, made me realize the vastness that is beyond my comprehension. That's what happened with the Scablands too. Yeah, it's like, you know it's big, and then you get out there and you're like, yep, it's, I knew it was big, and it's even bigger than I thought it was, <laughs> even when I, when I knew it was big, and now I know that it's too big. Yes. To really think <laughs> it's about. It's too big. <laughs> and so, yeah, to correct, I guess to correct that, it's, uh, you know, it's half the, the I was talking about the, the guy who measured the flows from Eddie Narrows, which would have been everything from that basin that we were in. Yeah. Versus the flows from south of Ponderé. I don't remember where the, uh, what that place was and called. There wasn't enough water coming through Eddie Narrows to right. make up the flow down there. Yeah. To put it in, in turn, I mean, we could talk about cubic feet per second. We could talk about cubic meters per second. I like to talk about cubic miles per second because, you know, in. Yeah. You know, really almost what you need to do is you're going to need to, to comp get your head around what one cubic mile of water is. You almost need to go out and stand on a prominence somewhere where you have clear view, 90 degrees in both directions, one mile. Yeah. And you it's, need a it's plane. pretty far. Yeah, you yes. need a plane need, a mile above you, yeah. You need something <laughs> an, an a mile above you, yes, <laughs> to picture. You know, I try to say, well, picture a, 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 an ice cube one mile on a side. And then you think one draining of Lake Missoula is 600 of those, just one draining. Yeah. God. But we're looking at multiple drainings because that water kept, and see, I mean, think about it. If we really wanted to cover the whole territory, for example, we would be up there in Boulder Park in Washington, and we would drive north hundreds of miles further up the Okanagan Valley, tracing the same damn flood. Yeah. We could do, you know, if we go to the north end of Flathead Lake, there at the south end of Rocky Mountain Trench, 
start driving there all the way up to Prince George. We're still in the flood. Yeah, it's crazy. The go, other great, the other great, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you know, drive west down through the Columbia Gorge. There you are. The, you know, we, we haven't even done taken that in yet. At some point, we got to figure out how to include the Columbia Gorge in a tour, hmm. you know, because that is spectacular in its own right. And then make some side excursions up some of those um, tributary rivers because they're amazing and have these enormous back flood uh, landscapes in them. Then you get down there to Portland. And then you go south all the way to the south end of Willamette Valley. And you got a massive back flood that has entered that valley loaded with icebergs. Those icebergs are loaded with erratic boulders. And then I think we talked about the, um, the Willamette meteorite, didn't we? Oh, yeah. That, yes. Man, the pictures of that thing are just. Now, see, and, 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 and what's wild that. about that is, number one, it was in a cluster of basalt erratics and with some granite mixed in, which is undoubtedly from the, from can, uh, Canada, right? Yeah. So yeah. apparently you had basalt out of Washington, granite out of southern British Columbia, and that meteorite all being carried together on an iceberg that then back floated south into the Willamette Valley, came to ground, and then melted away and left that pile there. Like, hey, look at this. Yeah. How about this for some forensic evidence, huh? <laughs> So that, I would yeah. I would venture to say that the Willamette meteorite is probably one little speck crumb of whatever fell over the ice sheet. Hmm. You know, we uh, we drove as a family up there and then on the way back and we got to take different routes because we obviously we drove to Spokane and then we left from Flathead from um, from Flathead Lake on the way back. It was great because we went down by Salt Lake City. Mm. And got to drive through the Bonneville Basin. Oh, yeah. Man. So yeah. after after mm -hmm. spending all that time in, around the Missoula area and seeing all the strand lines and all this mm -hmm. stuff, then mm -hmm. we get mm -hmm. down in there and we start. We're like looking at these mountains way out there in the desert, and you're like, there it is, you know. And we're going through these catastrophic, what look like catastrophic flood on areas on the north end of the basin. On the north end of the basin, yeah. basalt cliffs. Yeah. yeah. Crazy yeah. huge channels and. And you get out and you're just like, like, okay, we're in a huge valley and it's got strand lines way up on the mountains, way out there on both sides. And you drive, you're going 80 <laughs> miles an hour for hours and you go through another channel and then you come out and there's another one. You're like, wow, we're still yep. in the lake. Oh man, it was amazing. Such a great it, trip. It, 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 um, yeah, it kind of, uh, conveys a kind of a different impression of this planet we live on. And yes. And, and then to the realize there's two realizations that kind of happen in tandem here. One is just trying to grasp this reality of these such enormous events and the type of climatic consequences that would be implied by events of this scale, right? You're not just going to have some, some phenomena like this, this multi-state flooding. You were talking, look, we're talking Utah, Idaho, Montana, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, Alberta. Right. Nevada, yeah, Nevada, we got to include Nevada in that. Right. Yeah. And that's Finger just, yeah. yeah, exactly. So not only is it the, just, you know, coming to grips with the existence of such phenomena and realizing that phenomena on this scale and magnitude are not some science fiction or fantasy, or it, it's not some disaster movie. It's fucking real. Right. That's that's number one. Number two is that almost no one knows about it. Virtually no. I mean, think about how many people outside of our circle and some geologists have even the slightest comprehension of this kind of scale of events that we're talking about here. The surprising thing to me is, as I've, you know, had the opportunity to, uh, you know, to communicate or to. Um, you know, to, to exchange ideas with professionals in the, uh, you know, in geology and related fields is that most of them don't really know either. No, most of them don't know the magnitude of these events. You guys brought in the Bonneville flood and, you know, we've been pointing at the Tammany bar, um, 
deposits and outcrop for multiple shows. We've we've made reference to that, and what that tells us about the the temporal relationship between these two phenomena. Yeah, I kind of wish we would have diverted to go look at that. I didn't realize we were going to be going down into the Bonneville basin until too it's late. been scraped away. That that exposure is no longer there. Yeah, so we're going to have to get them to cut a new one because yeah, it's it's <laughs> been. It's Call been up the quarry become part tandem. of the quarry. <laughs> yeah, it, uh, it's been sorted and scraped away. Mm. Yeah, but at least we have photo documentation of the... That's uh, right. Yeah. And whatever the change in the climate was that allowed these ice caps to form, um, once they form, they then have secondary consequences. One, which is that the jet stream is pushed farther south. So that jet stream is now moving over these arid basins of the Western states and giving a lot more precipitation, which caused a lot more lakes to form a lot more greenery and so on. Right now, I think that there was probably a lake in the, a large lake, much larger than modern day great salt lake for sure in the basin of Lake Bonneville, but at its peak Bonneville Lake was up to a thousand feet deep. I would speculate that, Probably during the latter part of the Pleistocene, you might have had a lake in there that varied between two and three up to maybe five or six hundred feet deep. But then the flood was a consequence of, of an anomalous filling, which would have been connected with an anomalous rise in lake level, which would have been an anomalous precipita precipitation. Prolonged, perhaps, I would think it was prolonged. And I would also look, and, and this is the work that still needs to be done, is the correlation, the temporal correlation of these different events. Because we can go into um, Chiricahua Mountains, for example, down in southern Arizona, flanking Arizona and New Mexico, and there's evidence of, um, of uh, massive erosion of the welded tufts that form the Chiricahua Mountains and Lake... Um, you remember, Brad, the name of the lake there? We visited Wilcox Playa. Wilcox, Wilcox, yeah. Will, thanks, Brad. Wilcox Playa, which is a, a dry lake basin, but we actually did go and find, we found the shoreline. We have pictures of us standing on the ancient shoreline. So there was a massive lake that formed next to the Chiricahua Mountains that have this really extreme erosion on them. And it's a, that would be a very interesting tour to take. What we don't have is a pr precise chronological correlation between these events. You know, are they happening separately and independently, or is the gigantic flooding in the Southern Appalachians happening at the same time as the gi gigantic flooding in Arizona or the, the spillover of Lake Bonneville or the cutting of the Finger Lakes? I don't know. But this is this needs to happen in order to make sense out of all this. We really that's what we need is a really precise chronology correlating all of these events in time. But we don't have that. So anything we've got, you know, it, 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 let's suppose it all happened at once. That's one extreme or it happened over a period of a few thousand years. And I don't think that any of the chronologies we've got so far don't precisely correlate anything, say, even to the to the century, much less say a decade or a year's time. But if it's a millennia, you still got the other sequences that all of these events apparently from the dating of them would have happened within a two or three or maybe a 4,000 year interval. Okay, so if you've got all of these incredibly huge, intense flooding events, which would require intense precipitation of events, if they're happening all at once, that's one thing. Are they happening? Um, independently of others, separated, say, by decades or centuries. If that's the case, how do you explain that? See, we don't know yet. We just don't have enough correlation between these phenomena, but we do know enough to say that, yeah, everywhere you look around North America, you can see evidence of these catastrophic events. Now, to what extent can we connect these dots into a coherent phenomenon? I don't know the answer to that. But that's kind of where the work that lies ahead of us um, 
you know, and, and either and you, way, either way, either one of those two extremes is going to raise extremely profound questions. And, and yeah, and, and, and I do, I mean, I would lean towards a multiple, uh, sort of a, an epoch of where you've got, well, you think about a, 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 like an earthquake, an earthquake might be preceded by four shocks. There may be several, you know, huge tremors and then a series of aftershocks. Right. But, and, and even though you could say there's discrete foreshocks and aftershocks, it's still part of the same event, the same phenomena. I see where you're going. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and, and if we go back to, you know, the work of Victor Klub and Bill Napier and Asher and those guys, you know, and this, which to me sounds more and more credible all the time that there are episodes or periods of, of, of concentrated bombardment epochs bombardment epochs if you want to call them that um then yeah why not i mean now you've got a mechanism that could that could uh trigger multiple catastrophes over a few thousand years you know in, in a if you've got a situation where you've got earth crossing a a relatively young fresh stream of meteoritic meteoritic debris um as a result of a disintegrating comet and there's absolutely absolutely evidence that such a thing happened you know the comet enki rudniki the the tarred meteor streams that all of these are part of the same family of of material that was uh the consequence of this disintegration of this great comet which i would speculate probably whose first arrival in the inner solar system is what triggered the final what's called the late wisconsin phase of the Wisconsin Ice Age, which goes back over 100,000 years. But there was clearly a major event that, that triggered or launched the final phase somewhere between 25 and 28,000 years ago, right? Because there was a major climate de, uh, degeneration from an interstadial warmth and a major retraction of the great ice sheets over North America. And then 26, 27, 28,000 years ago, somewhere in that Climate cool, glaciers expand rapidly so that you now get to 21, 22,000 years ago and you are in the full fledged late glacial maximum that now sort of predominates somewhere between until about, I don't know, 15 to, to 20,000 years. And then it begins to ameliorate and the ice begins to shrink back. But there's one major punctuation mark in there if the dating is to be. Um, accepted and that would be well meltwater pulse 1a which is at about 14,600 years ago so what triggered meltwater pulse 1a but uh yeah so that's why um we need an influx of fresh young talent and minds and thinkers into you know the the, the um disciplines of earth history and knowledge of the earth and I got to say this, you know, part of what's happened here is that geology has been replaced by um, essentially environmental geology, which is like a different animal, mm -hmm. um, which is important and good stuff. Don't get me wrong. But like I, I can use the example of, of Amory where, you know, Julie got her degree and she, she took geology over there and it was like 20 years after I took geology, but you know, when I took geology, studying geology formally in, in the university setting, catastrophism had just become more or less accepted. And that was primarily as a result of, you know, the, the realization of the uh, impact geology. Impact geology was really pretty actively being studied and pursued throughout the 80s and into the early 90s. Um, you know, because at that first, that year, 1980, was when those three independent papers came out, all speculating uh, that the mass extinction at the end of the Cretaceous was caused by an impact. And, of course, the one that was the, the most well-known was, the, was the, uh, uh, the Alvarez paper that studied the iridium deposits in Italy. And then that was followed by a, rapidly by a series of papers by other geologists and other teams looking at the same Cretaceous tertiary boundary first, I think in, in Denmark, then in New Zealand, and then followed up by 
you know, a dozen other places around the world. And every place they looked at the KT boundary, there was that spike of iridium. So suddenly it was not pseudoscientific anymore to think about, you know, world changing impacts. And then, but by the time Julie got in, th that had all been all the, the new catastrophism that was prevalent in, in my textbook was gone from her textbook and it was re replaced by environmentalism. And instead of learning about ice ages and the impacts and mass extinctions, she had to actually watch Inconvenient Truth twice in order to get her to, not once, once wasn't good enough, but in order to get her diploma, she had to watch it twice. She had wow. to watch it. So she, she had to watch it twice. Well, I know we're we're a hell of a brainwashing going on. Yeah. We're planning to tackle some uh climate events, uh, but we're right up on a break. So you want to take the break, come back and dive into that material? What do you say? Yeah, and then we'll start, yeah, we'll start laying out a, a, a map that people can use to try to really begin to understand the big picture of global change, of climate change. Etc. Planetary change, because that's all encompassed within planetary change. And then ultimately, planetary change is encompassed within an even larger framework of cosmic change. So, all right, we're going to be right. trying over, over several uh, podcasts, we'll be attempting to integrate these various magnitudes of perception. And definitely, we're going to the Scablands. So, those are available also contact at the cabin.com and randallcarlson.com tours and events. All those links are going to be in the description as always. And, uh, it's a great time. It's freaking incredibly great people and amazing sceneries and, uh, just a good time for all. So, uh, yeah, come on out with us. All right, welcome back, everybody, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. Speaking of back, I want to go back to 1888 and some of the early writings about um, the Great Ice Age um, by a professional geologist, in this case, James Geike. If you look him up, G-E-I-K-I-E, -E, anybody wants to look him up and learn more about him, James Geike, yeah, he was uh, a very pivotal character, very pivotal um, contributions to the study of our planet back in the late 19th century. And he did a lot of really interesting work on the ice ages. He was particularly um, um, interested in that subject. So he wrote this book that came out in 1888. It was 545 pages. It was entitled The Great Ice Age and Its Relation to the Antiquity of Man. And he... he he made some very interesting observations that weren't necessarily original to him, but were being made in the late 19th century that raised some very um, provocative questions. Here's the problem that Geike was confronted with. He's looking at cave deposits and river deposits, and he's finding the fossilized remains of animals that lived in temperate climates, in um, Arctic climates. And thirdly, as he says, warm climates. So you've got warm climates, temperate climates, and Arctic climates. Animal remains of species that are endemic to each of these different kinds of environments. So in trying to explain how you have this commingling of these different uh, species that are, um, you know, products of completely different environmental circumstances, he looks at the idea of could they have been mass migrations of an Arctic species to a temperate zone or vice versa, or a warm latitude species to a temperate zone or to an Arctic. And the more he looks at that, the more untenable that idea seems to become. What would be the reason that you would have this massive migration of Arctic animals, say, to a temperate climate? Well, maybe that's a question that's still worth asking, but in any case, he does not believe that migrations, migratory uh, movements of these animal species could explain this commingling. So he says the theory of animal, an, annual 
migrations being, as I have tried to show, untenable, we can now only explain the remarkable commingling of northern, southern, and temperate groups in our superficial deposits by assuming that certain great oscillations of climate characterize the accumulation of our cave earths and river gravels. Through study of sedimentary archives, it has become increasingly apparent that during much of the last 65 million years and beyond, Earth's climate system has experienced continuous change, drifting from extremes of expansive warmth with ice-free poles to extremes of cold with massive continental ice sheets and polar ice caps. And here's where it's relevant to everything we've been talking about through all of these episodes. Geologically abrupt shifts in climate, as well as transient events, brief but extreme excursions, often associated with profound impacts on global environments and the biosphere. So we can see there that what I'm trying to show here is that over a period of, of uh, more than a century, 120 years, you've got the, the insight and research that is current and contemporary is actually confirming what these guys of 100 to 120 and 150 years ago were beginning to realize, which is that there are these, whether you want to call them uh, abrupt, geologically abrupt events or certain great oscillations of climate, what we have between then and now is an encyclopedia of information and scientific research that's been uh, conducted that demonstrates overwhelmingly the, um, the reality of massive climate and environmental changes, sometimes extremely fast, and orders of magnitude beyond anything we've experienced um, within the last couple of centuries that would encompass what we think of as modern civilization, which may go back far enough to uh, basically uh, correlate with the, um, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. No, oh, excellent. So this is the guy. So he was the founder of the Climate Research Unit that became quite famous and controversial with the, uh, remember the release of the Climate Gate about 10 years ago? The thing about Hubert Lamb is even though he founded the, the CRU, the Climate Research Unit, that basically provides all of the climate data that the IPCC uses, and then was embroiled in the controversy, the climate gate controversy, when the emails between uh, yes, Phil Jones that. and some of these other guys got released, which we're going to talk about a little bit, but not right now. But so that that um, institution that they work for is the Climate Research Unit, and it was founded by this guy here. However, what's interesting here is I suspect that if Hubert Lamb, who passed away, in, as you can see, in 1997, would be rather dismayed about what has happened politically in the institution which he established. So let's look at what he actually said back in the day when he was uh, founding this institution. He wrote this uh, paper called An Approach to the Study of the Development of Climate and Its Impact in Human Affairs. It appeared in the, uh, the compilation Climate in History, edited by T.M.L. Wigley. M.J. Ingram and G. Farmer. It was published by Cambridge University Press. Uh, totally and thoroughly legitimate scholarly work. So let's listen to what Hubert had to say. Around 1880 to 1900, it was apparent from the first 100-year series of weather observations that the climatic averages of that time were very similar to those of a century earlier. And it became conventional to treat climate as essentially constant. Accordingly, the study of the development and possible changes of climate was given a very low priority, or more generally, neglected altogether. Given these circumstances, it was natural that the general public and workers in other disciplines also ignored the possibility 
that climate might not always be so stable and climatic change might affect their affairs. Of course, this did not apply to occasional extreme events, but the incidents of these, it was generally supposed, could be treated as random. By 1950, however, it was obvious that the climate had been changing significantly during the 20th century, though in ways, now this is important, in ways which made things easier for most human activities in most parts of the world. Why did things become easier for most human activities in most parts of the world? He goes on and he says, there had been a general rise of prevailing temperatures with recession of the ice of the Arctic seas and increasingly rapid recession of the glaciers almost everywhere. If we will demonstrate the influence of the climatic development and shocks produced in the course of this on human history, we must look first at extreme cases. For this purpose, the record of the last thousand years is well suited because it seems to have included a notably wide range of climatic regimes. The high Middle Ages evidently saw a persistently warm climatic epoch, which lasted until about 1300 to 1310 in Europe and affected about at least two thirds of the Northern Hemisphere in the previous one to 200 years. A peak of warmth seems to have been attained a few centuries earlier in Greenland and much more of the Arctic. And cooling in those regions may have been responsible for an increase of storminess affecting the North Sea and perhaps much of the Atlantic and Europe after AD 1200. Now here it's important to note, okay, and this is as we go through this, you begin to see how this begins to add up. But we'll, it's important to note that there is this well-documented increase in storminess and intense weather events that followed in the wake of the global cooling of the Little Ice Age. The following centuries brought a series of changes, some of them abrupt, leading to the so-called Little Ice Age between about 1550 and 1700 or later, when the extent of ice on the Arctic Sea and of ice and snow on land seems to have been, very important, seems to have been greater than at any time since the last major glaciation. That's some of the words of, of Hubert Lamb. Okay, and so he clearly is seeing that there have been some pretty considerable changes in the last millennium. Herman wrote a book, uh, was called The Climate of Europe, Past, Present, and Future. He, he was, had an enormous, voluminous output of writings on, on climate, uh, climate change and climate. Um, this was part of the Atmospheric Sciences Library, published by D. Rydell Publishing Company. Um, it's chapter two, climate in the last thousand years, subtitled natural climatic fluctuations and change. So here's Hermann. Climate, even under its natural development alone, varies continually. Each year, each decade, each century, each millennium, since long before any question of impact of human activity. It is important to gauge the magnitudes and timescales of these variations, since planning should not be based on expectations of return to some non-existent norm. And the magnitude and extent of any changes attributable to man's activities, or even whether any such effects are occurring on more than a local scale, cannot be determined without knowing the range and the likely timing of changes due to natural causes. Extension of the record to earlier times by systematic use of the numerous historical documentary reports of weather available in Europe, as well as various forms of fossil or 
proxy data indicates that the last thousand years saw a particularly great swing of the prevailing temperature level of more or less global extent. Now, I think the implication, I'm going to make an aside comment there, that the implication of that is clearly contradicts the notion of those who are arguing that the medieval warm period and the Little Ice Age were not global in extent. I think we can go back 40 years and we can find extensive evidence from that time to this that the medieval warm period, the, the, uh, the, the preceding Dark Ages cold period and the uh, succeeding um, or subsequent Little Ice Age were all, in fact, global in extent. He goes on, the variations with which we are most concerned for planning purposes must be those on time scales from a single season up to 100 to 200 years. But it is worth noting in connection with the century to century prospect that a recent survey by Wigley et al. in 1979 indicates that each of the last three millennium has produced a period of colder climate and advancing glaciers in its middle centuries after a warmer period around the beginning the beginning of the millennium. The longer-term variations also are therefore of more than academic interest. Climatic changes come on several different timescales, between short-term fluctuations lasting a few years and changes extending over thousands of years, there are variations over a few centuries which may have profound effects on natural phenomena and human affairs. It is variations on this scale, stretching over several generations, with which we are concerned in studying the Little Ice Age. There we go. Okay. There it is. The Mer de Glace, Glace, uh, this is an example of a, a valley being overrun by a Little Ice Age glacier. We can go through and look at some of these. You kind of get the the uh, here's here so here's the 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 print from oh, oh yeah. probably the early 18 late 17 early 1800s and then a photograph that would have i think been taken in the 90s and so you can see the arrows pointing oh, out wow. here the high marks oh yeah H here's the important thing though that people need to realize this glacier recession did not begin in the last few decades it began at the end of the Little Ice Age between the early and mid 1800s and has been ongoing since. Let's go here. You see this is Little Ice Age moraines in Svalbard Island. Well, so here we are on Svalbard looking at Svalbard and you see the moraine, the, the, oh yeah, very oh, yeah. clearly. That's the Little Ice Age moraine. Okay. So interesting perspective here is during the Great Ice Age, this valley would have been completely filled with ice. Mm. That is gone now, and during and then uh, during the Little Ice Age, this was the extent to which the uh, valley glacier extended out. You know, the tributary valley extended out onto the plain, and then it's receded this much between its uh, max maximum extension and its withdrawal at the time this picture was taken, which was probably early mid nineties. This caused a lot of anxiety to these I people. Bet. Yeah. Watching was... this get grow day by day, moving in like it's going to wipe out yeah, their existence. crushing trees, making noise, like groaning yeah, all night. Yeah. Yeah. It yeah. sounded like a monster coming out of the mountains. Yeah. Yep. So this is about 1780. And then here's a photograph from 1966. Mm. Look at there. So it's gone. You see, it's completely receded up. Yeah. The whole area is becoming reforested in here compared to here so this is an that's what i'm talking about look at that yeah okay so you're bringing up the pictures i was just mentioning it's like he, i've seen some of this yeah it's amazing yeah, yeah so, the glacier's totally gone yep look at that <laughs> i thought that must Thor have been destroyed all the ice giants yeah what happened odin Odin. Odin. That's who it was. Yeah, Odin. <laughs> uh -huh. He destroyed the Slew ice giants. the ice giants. That's yes. right. <laughs> and then here's Southern Alps of New Zealand. This is a good one. This is, um, oops. Use that arrow key, Randall. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Stop using your mouse. There you go. And, and Kronos has put his hat on, so we got to wrap it up here.
Okay. Well, yeah, look at that, man. You know, just find a good ending point. Yeah. Three fifths of well, we got about four more or five more images. We'll just breeze through them here. And you can see the recession. So here we are, uh, about 1872, 1905. And so this is recession, major recession is taking place long before any thought of carbon dioxide induced gl a global warming. And here we are, 1940. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah. So this map, the, the majority of this glacier recession took place prior to World War II. And all sides concerned to this, with this, generally conceded around World War II and in the immediate thereafter was when carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere may have just reached the minimal amount necessary to affect any kind of noticeable or measurable warming. The coldest centuries in 8,000 years, the Little Ice Age causes and human consequence. The coldest century, now, as we conclude, let's just keep this in mind. When we're, if, if we're looking at the coldest centuries in 8,000 years, and then we have any warming at all relative to that, it's going to appear, it's going to appear anomalous, right? But when you look at the big picture, there's nothing. What's anomalous is the cold weather Not that we're warming. using as the baseline. Right. Yeah. And this will end with this, this graph because this shows uh, the average length of 169 glaciers from 1700 to 2000. The principal source of melt energy is solar radiation. Variations in glacier mass and length are primarily due to temperature and precipitation. So there you go, Kyle. That answers your question right there. Temperature and precipitation. This melting trend lags the temperature increase by about 20 years. So it predates the six-fold increase in hydrocarbon use even more than shown in the figure. So here you see what's happening here. Between 1800 and 1850, there's a, there's a trend, and this is the shortening of the glaciers here. So dash line, before hydrocarbon increase, during increase. So notice where they put that right about the end of World War II. Right. And so you see, here's the trend line. So the trend line, this is the point I was trying to make in this graph. This graph really portrays it, is that the, and again, as it's saying here, this trend line should actually be moved back because there's this 20-year uh, uh, lag. But in any case, you don't see any change at all here. You know, if global warming, carbon dioxide was driving, had any connection with glacier recession, you should see a major change in the trend line after 19. 45, 1950, but you don't, it's, it's the glacier recession is just continuing to do what it had done for 150 years previously. And how many people really understand that when you talk about glacier recession, we have to put things in context. So, um, we'll conclude for now. So but are you, are you saying that I mean, that graph said that primary source of melt was solar radiation. Are you telling me that the sun is melting? I wouldn't glaciers? say anything like that, would I? <laughs> I mean, it kind of makes sense that the sun might be the source of uh, the heat. I kind of, mm. I think that's probably a <laughs> kind of makes sense. Yeah. Kind of makes sense, yeah. doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Well, thanks, Randall. Oh, great, you're welcome. Great, and I hope you guys don't. Don't mind over the next few episodes, we're going to dive deep into the subject here. No, I, I'm, I'm loving all it. about it. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. Yeah. Sign up for the newsletter. Yep. Yeah. And I'll mention also, we've got some juicy stuff planned for through the rest of the summer and into the fall for what we're going to be doing and uh, the information we're going to be covering because I've decided it's time for more disclosure. All right. Ooh, mm. I like the sound of that. Yeah. The I've been open. getting signals lately. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. M All moon, right, guys. Moon Let's signals? Do. Hmm. <laughs> Where are these Great start. mysterious signals come from? I want <laughs> to get flagged. <laughs> Uh-oh. Welcome to flags. All right, guys. Good night. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Yeah.